Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Maureen Welton from the Saturna Island Marine Research and Education Society known as SIMRES and I'm on sunny Saturna Island overlooking Boundary Pass. You can just see it behind me. This is where we often see whales on Saturna and maybe we'll get lucky and some will come and join us today. We're delighted to collaborate on this Kids Sea Talk with Parks Canada. Anna and Selby have developed this program just for you and we think you're going to love it. You may have some questions as we go along and you're welcome to turn on the Q&A in your controls below and ask any questions. Selby will be answering your questions as we go. Your adult may need to help you with this. So let's get started and here's Anna Howard, our presenter. Thank you so much, Maureen. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Anna and I'm joining you today uh, with Parks Canada to talk to li a little bit about the Southern resident killer whales. Now before I begin, I do want to acknowledge that I'm coming to you virtually today from the traditional territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam First Nations. I'm so grateful to get to come to you from this land today and get to learn and teach and play on this land. And I would really encourage all of you to take a moment as well today to think about where you're joining from virtually. So today we're going to be spending about 30 minutes on a little virtual boat ride. So we'll be on our virtual boat ride for about 20 minutes and we'll have the chance to learn about Southern resident killer whale family structures, food chains, and then for the last 10 minutes, we'll have some opportunities for a question period. So if you're able just to save those questions to the end, um, or you can also just type them into the chat and my colleague Selby will be answering some questions in there. So as you can see behind me here, I actually, there's a little Parks Canada research boat there. And I'm joining you today from the Gulf of Georgia Cannery National Historic Site, which is one of our Parks Canada places. And on our boat ride, we are going to be heading towards the Gulf Islands National Park Reserve as well. And these are both Parks Canada places. And if you're not familiar with Parks Canada at all, basically we get to protect and present uh, naturally and culturally significant areas of our beautiful country here. All right, well, without further ado, I'm gonna get my life jacket on. And I'm super, super excited because I have a really good feeling that we're going to get to see some Southern resident killer whales today. No guarantee, but fingers crossed. All right, let's head over to the boat. I'll meet you over there. All right, welcome <coughs> aboard. And I don't know about all of you, but I'm so excited to head over to the Gulf Islands National Park Reserve. I'm super excited to maybe see some whales. All right, so as I think about Southern Resident Killer Whales, I kind of start to think about family. And I don't know about all of you, but I've been spending a lot of time with my family recently. So for all of May and all of June, I was able to go home and spend a ton of time with my family and get to bond with them, lots and lots. And maybe you've also had that same opportunity recently. And when I start to think about family, I start thinking of words like love and loyalty and protection. And maybe you think of some of those words too when you think of your family. And family can mean a lot of different things. It can mean things like um, my best friends. It can also mean my family that I was born into, my parents and my sisters. So maybe you have a different definition of family than I do. But if you have some words that come up uh, when you think of the word family, you can go ahead and type those into the chat if you would like to. Now, the reason why I'm kind of thinking about my family when I think of Southern resident killer whales is because Southern resident killer whale families aren't so different from us. So I did bring my binoculars today and I'm gonna be keeping a close eye out on the water here to see if I can see some of those families. So I want all of you to also keep a close eye on the water because I don't want to miss anything. My eyesight isn't always the best, so I might need your help a little bit. So just keep an eye out on the water. I hope you brought your binoculars too. Oh, 
Does anyone see that? I just saw a little spurt off in the distance. Okay, I think those are southern resident killer whales. Can, can you see them? Oh, right. I'm so sorry. You don't have binoculars. Okay, I'm just going to come around. You can borrow mine. I'm going to help you. Right. Do you all see that? Yeah, those are definitely southern resident killer whales. So we've got a family of southern resident killer whales there. You can see they have really tall dorsal fins. The male adults actually have dorsal fins that can grow up to six feet tall. So that's taller than I am. And that's also about 1.8 meters. You can also see some of them have a little bit of that gray patch just behind their dorsal fin. And that's called their saddle patch. And it's really cool because just like how all of us have unique fingerprints, every single southern resident killer whale, every single killer whale has a unique saddle patch. And that's how scientists are able to identify individual killer whales, which is really, really cool, especially because there's so many, so it can be hard to keep track of them. You can also see that they have that black coloring on top. You can't really see it from our binoculars, but they also have a white coloring on the bottom. And that's how they're able to kind of blend into their environment. So fish from the bottom see their white, which kind of blends in with the light sky. And fish from above see the black, which kind of blends in with the dark ocean bottom. And as we're watching them here, you can see how important their family structures really are. They hunt together, they travel together, they're always with one another. And so it's super, super important for their survival. This has been so cool. I always am looking out for the southern resident killer whales when I'm out on the ocean here. Wow, that was so cool. I really hope that you felt excited about that because like I said, it's kind of a rare opportunity to see these guys. All right, so as I was saying, these family structures are so important to their survival. And I actually have a little bit of a family tree here. And this family tree is called a matriline. So the matriline is led by the oldest female in the family. So as you can see right here on my tree, that's the whale at the top. And she's the one who knows where the best hunting grounds are. She leads the group. She'll share food with everyone. And everyone travels with that oldest female. Now, usually these whales spend their entire lives with, that, with their mothers. So when they're born into their family, they stay with their mother, they travel with their mother's family all the way up until the time that they pass away. There is one exception to this rule and his name is Onyx. Now Onyx is the only killer whale that we know of who has actually changed families throughout his lifetime. So he was born into L pod, one of the three Southern resident killer whale pods. Then he switched over to K pod. And then he switched over to J pod. And most recently, scientists think that he's been hanging out with his original family again, L pod. So he is definitely the exception to the rule there. Now, there are other types of killer whales as well that you might have heard of that aren't southern resident killer whales. There is also northern resident killer whales, which, as the name would sound, it, they hang out over on the north coast of BC. There's also transient killer whales, which are also found around here, and you sometimes will see them off the coast of BC as well. And there's also offshore killer whales, and you won't really see the, those around BC. They hang out way over in the open ocean. All right, so every family tree needs strong roots. So I have my strong family tree roots here. One of these is having a clean space to keep their family tree strong. The second is having food to keep their family strong. And the final one is having a quiet space to keep their family tree strong. So the first one that I want to talk to you a little bit about today is having that quiet space. So because the southern resident killer whales do live around big cities like Vancouver and Victoria and Seattle, there can be quite a bit of noise in the water due to lots of boats around those cities. 
And because Southern resident killer whales rely on communication with their families, they're always talking to one another. And also they rely on echolocation, which is basically using sound to bounce uh, their sound off of an object to locate that object and hunt for it. They require uh, lots of that communication. So without that communication, it can be hard for them. So I'm gonna play a couple of sounds for you here. The first sound is a really quiet water where the orcas are communicating with one another with no boat noise in the background. You can hear how clearly they're talking to one another here. Now the second sound that I wanna play for you is an example of a boat motor passing underwater really close by. So we'll play that for you now. You can hear it's pretty loud. It's a lot louder than what we were just hearing with the Southern Resident Killer Whales communicating with one another. Um, one another. So as you can hear those differences, it's definitely clear which sound was easier for the Southern Resident Killer Whales to be communicating in. Now, the second route that I want to talk a little bit about is having clean space. So I don't know about all of you, but on a really hot summery day, a 30 degree day, I want to jump in a nice cold lake. That's always the first place I want to be. But if that lake is full of garbage and full of chemicals, I definitely don't want to be jumping into that lake. Now, I can, I'm sure you can imagine that southern resident killer whales don't want to be swimming in a habitat like that either. So that is one thing that we are definitely focusing on today as well, having lots of clean space for this family tree to stay strong. But the final route that we're going to be talking about a lot today is that third route, food. So if any of you want to take a guess, either in your heads or you can type it into the chat as well, uh, what food do the Southern Resident Killer Whales depend upon? So I'll give you a couple of hints if you don't know. They swim a little bit like this. They kind of have a silvery outside and a pink inside. And humans also really like to eat this food. I'll give you a couple seconds to think about that. If you'd like to type in the chat, go ahead. Otherwise, just think in your head. All right. Well, if anyone's thinking, hmm, that might sound a little bit like salmon, then you're right. So the Southern Resident Killer Whales love salmon, and particularly they love Chinook salmon, which is the largest out of the five species of salmon that we have here on BC's coast. So as I was saying, these three roots are causing the Southern Resident Killer Whales to struggle a little bit right now. So they are endangered with only 72 individuals left, but luckily it's not too late and there's so much that we can do to protect them. And I wanna to talk to you a little bit about some of the research going on in Parks Canada places to protect that third route, their food source. So I want to, go a little bit diver, take a little bit of a uh, under, underwater sea dive. So I'm gonna get my wetsuit on, I'm gonna get my goggles on, take off this life jacket, and let's just go for a dive and check out some of the underwater processes going on here on BC's coast. All right, I'm gonna meet you down there. All right, welcome to this amazing underwater ecosystem. So I wanna take a closer look at some of the processes affecting the Southern Resident Killer Whale food chain. Now, when I say food chain, I basically mean the transfer of energy from one organism to the next organism. So for me, I love oatmeal. So for example, I had oatmeal this morning for breakfast and the oats get their energy from the sun and I get my energy from the oats. And that's a really basic example of a food chain. So we're going to talk a lot about the Southern Resident Killer Whale food chain. And speaking of which, I actually see the first level of the food chain here. And if you look right here, these are called zooplankton. And particularly, they're called copepods. Now, if you've never seen these before, or you're thinking, 
That looks really odd. These are basically tiny, tiny little animals. And if you've ever seen the uh, show SpongeBob before, these little guys, the copepods, kind of look like the main, one of the main characters, Plankton. So they are, uh, they are really, really tiny. And they float in huge numbers in the water. And there's a, a ton of energy within these little zooplankton. So they're really important to the food chain because they form the base of that food chain. And a little fish called the Pacific Stanlance really requires those zooplankton for their energy. And I actually see one coming now, if you look just over there. Yeah, <laughs> there's one right there. That's called the Pacific Sandlance. And they're the second layer of this food chain. So they live and require really, really fine sandy habitat. So they bury their eggs in that fine sandy habitat, they hide in it, and they also forage or hunt for their food in that fine sandy habitat. Now, Parks Canada researchers at Gulf Islands National Park Reserve and Pacific Rim National Park Reserve are working really hard to find out if any of their habitat is disappearing because they need that habitat to lay their eggs and hide in and hunt in. And so the Parks Canada researchers are doing a research project for about five years where they're focusing on that fine sandy habitat. And this is really important because our friend, the Chinook salmon, which I actually see just coming over here right now. If you look right there, there's the Chinook salmon. So the Chinook salmon really uh, depends on those Pacific salmons. And actually about two thirds to a half of their diet is dependent on those Pacific salmons. One time, one of our Gulf Islands National Park researchers found 400 Pacific salmons in this little guy's stomach. Not a little guy, he's a big guy. The Chinook salmon is the biggest Chinook sa biggest Pacific salmon in BC. So they can eat a ton of those little fish. So this research is super, super important uh, to be done so that we can make sure that the Chinook salmon have healthy populations. And like I was saying earlier, that's because the southern resident killer whale depends on the Chinook salmon. So the southern resident killer whale is able to use echolocation to find out exactly where the Chinook salmon is. They can find out how big the Chinook salmon is, what direction they're traveling in even. And sometimes I kind of like to call the southern resident killer whale the food critic of the sea because they only eat the biggest, best, juiciest salmon, which are the Chinook salmon. So now do you see how important the food chain is? Without those, plentiful uh, zooplankton at the very bottom of the food chain, and without the Pacific sand lance, and without the Chinook salmon, the southern resident killer whales won't be able to thrive. All right, now I'm not sure about all of you, but I am feeling a little bit chilly down here underwater, so I think it's time to head back up to the boat. So I'll meet you back up there. All right, welcome back aboard. So as we've been learning a little bit about how southern resident killer whales are endangered, you might be wondering how you can help. And it can be easy sometimes to feel a little bit helpless because the problem is so dire. But luckily it's not too late. There's so much research being done. And please don't forget that you are also a really important part of their recovery. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how you and your families can help too. So let's go back to our little family tree and the strong roots that keep it strong and healthy. So the first action that you can take is for the food root here. And you can talk to your family about selecting ocean-wise seafood. Basically ocean-wise seafood is sustainably caught seafood that makes sure that they're is a lot of that seafood for future generations to enjoy. The second route that you can help out with is making sure that the southern resident killer whales have quiet spaces. So if you're ever out on the water this summer or next summer or this fall with an adult, then you can ask that adult to slow down and um, make sure that if you do see a southern resident killer whale that you're turning off your engine and keeping your distance. So my colleague is going to put a link in the chat right now for any adults watching 
just uh, talking about the 2020 management measures for the southern resident killer whales. So some of those management, management measures include staying 400 meters away from killer whales when you're out on the water. Now, the third thing that you can do that I think is really, really important, and it's my personal favorite, is making sure that you're telling your friends and your teachers and anyone that you meet about what you've learned today. The more voices that we have behind Southern Resident Killer Whale Recovery, the higher chance there is that we can make sure that they're being protected and staying healthy and strong. So that pretty much brings us to the end of our little boat ride here. And I really hope that you learned a little bit about Southern Resident Killer Whales and that you'll be taking some of the actions we just talked about to help keep their populations healthy and strong. So I'm gonna head back over to the shore and I'll meet you over there. All right, we are back at the Gulf of Georgia Cannery National Historic Site. So I just wanted to thank all of you so much for coming today and participating. And I wanted to remind you that all of you are key players in the Southern Resident Killer Whale Recovery. So thank you so much. And on behalf of Parks Canada, uh, thank you for listening and participating. And I would love to take any questions now. We have about 10 minutes, I believe. That was awesome, Anna. Thanks so much. No problem. Um, I know you've worked really hard on this. It's great. Thank you. Um, what a few thank yous here, okay? Um, I'd like to thank everybody from Parks Canada who's been involved in this presentation. Uh, Anna Howard, our presenter, uh, Selby Wilkinson, who's uh, behind the scenes and answering chats, uh, Frankie Marquez, who's the tech support, Rachel Sheeler, who's the interpreter of Parks Canada, who helped make this happen and led the team. Uh, we also want to thank our beloved Parks Canada interpreter on Saturna, Athena George. Um, all of this happened because of her encouragement, and we know she's missing all of you terribly this year, and we're really missing uh, the programs she does at East Point and around the island and hope to have them back next year. Uh, special thanks to a Saturna Island regular visitor and Montreal artist Arthur Demarteau for his beautiful artwork of the orcas at East Point. And uh, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about Simrez. Uh, we're a volunteer group on Saturna uh, who care deeply about the ocean the Salish Sea and everything that lives in it. We bring scientists to our island uh, to learn more about our marine environment and we want to share that with you and you can learn more about us at simres.ca. Uh, we've recorded this program and we'll be sharing it on our website in a few days and if you'd like to share it with others you'll be able to do so. So you can go to our website uh, at ctalks.ca. And just a little announcement about next Saturday evening, we'll have another Sea Talk with Lucy Quayle, a researcher who's been working on Saturna Island this summer. And uh, she's been uh, researching the whales. And uh, she'll be joined by her SFU supervisor, Ruth Joy. So please check our website for all the details and the login links uh, at seatalks.ca. So let's just see, are there any questions? Uh, do you see any, Anna? Yeah, it looks like we have a couple coming in at the uh, Q&A section here. So we have a first one, which is, what is the difference between Southern residents and transients? That's an awesome question. Thanks for asking that. So the main difference between residents and transients is based on what they eat. So the residents, which includes the northern and the southern resident killer whales, uh, they both like to eat salmon. So they're all just fish eaters. They mostly eat Chinook salmon, but they'll have a little bit of chum salmon in there in the fall. And the transients will eat other things. So they also like salmon, but they also really like seals and other marine mammals as well. So that's kind of the main difference. Um, when you're out on the water, if you're trying to uh, tell the difference between those two. It's a little bit harder, but there are a couple of differences. The southern resident killer whales have a little bit more of a hooked dorsal fin, and the transients typically have a bit more of a straight, tall dorsal fin. 
thanks for that question. And we have another question here that looks like, what is the government doing to reduce boat noise? Great question. So as I mentioned briefly in the video, um, I talked about the 2020 management measures. So if anyone is interested, that link is in the chat. It's the fisheries and oceans link there. And one of the main things is making sure that boats are staying away from southern resident killer whales. So one of those things is making sure that boats are staying 400 meters away in the critical habitat zones, which is where the southern residents forage a lot and um, are traveling a lot in the summer, especially. And another one of the things is there's a few voluntary measures. So boats are encouraged to slow down to seven knots or less when they are traveling out on the water and they see a southern resident killer whale, or if they are closer than that 400 meter uh, approach distance, then just to turn off their motors entirely. Thanks for that question. Okay, thank you. Anna. Oh. I think that's the end of the questions that we have. Uh, oh, is there another one? There's one more Just here. Uh, so this is also a really great question. Thank you for that question. It's what is the government doing to restrict Chinook fishing? So that is also a part of the 2020 management measures. There's a lot going on this summer. So I'd really encourage you to check out that website. But they, there are some fishery closures in important uh, Southern Resident Killer Whale foraging habitat this summer. So there's a few maps on that website that I linked where you can see where those fishery closures are. And hopefully that will help the Southern Resident Killer Whales a bit this summer too, and into the fall as well. Thanks for all those great questions. Those are all really, really important ones. Okay, well, I think that brings us to the end of our presentation. Thank you so much, Anna and Selby. You have been awesome. And um, thank you to everyone for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed this as much as we enjoyed bringing it to you. Thank you. Thanks Bye -bye. so much for having us.